Good morning and welcome back to World Talks here on TVP World with me, Ashim Kumar. Migration in the EU, not only is there a challenge which some countries are responding to by closing their borders, notably Germany, but also the question arises of how to repatriate those migrants who are already in the EU illegally and can we expect more to flood the European Union as a result of the wars in the Middle East. Well, to discuss all of these, we're joined by Romain Le Quinou. He's Managing Director at Euro Creative. Mr. Le Quinou, welcome to TVP World. Thanks for taking the time. Good morning, sir. Good morning to you. So let's start with the German <laughs> controls at the border. Um, what's behind it? Is it simply a political move or is there actually a practical reason uh, that, um, that that's that's uh, forcing the Chancellor to, to take this step. I, I think it's both. Uh, first, on the practical reason, this is about controlling who is entering and who is, you know, leaving the country. So there is a practical reason here. It's about tackling the number of illegal entries, of illegal migration within the country. So control back your own national border. And the second is also to control the profile of people, uh, you know, traveling back and forth to Germany, um, especially in a context where the country has experienced many um, terrorist attack, uh, low scale generally, but many terrorist attack over the past few years. Knife attacks, for example, uh, we know that a few months ago, a few weeks ago, uh, there were many. So uh, that's the first thing on the practical side. But then we cannot let aside the political context as well. And uh, the current government, the current coalition, uh, the three-party coalition has suffered major defeats, politically speaking. And we see the rise also of the extreme right, the IFD, which is talking openly about, you know, migration as being one of the main important problems for Germany. So this is a very political move. And we know that reinstoring um, control at the borders, so putting Schengen into um, into question, basically, is costly politically when it comes to, you know, your relation with your neighbors, but politically at the domestic level, it's something that you can show easily to citizens, that you take care back of the control. So, of course, it has a political aspect, and we know that uh, Chancellor Scholz um, is also looking to the election next year when it does such a move. Okay, now... That's very clearly laid out. Thank you for that. Do you expect there to be a domino effect? I mean, uh, the French Prime Minister has already said that, well, they're going to do the same thing. And, um, you know, where the two largest countries in the EU go, others may well follow. What do you think? Well, this is not something new, to be very honest. And we know that since 2015, um, the migration crisis, then a wave of terrorist attacks, uh, also during COVID, um, we've been experiencing uh, checks and border controls back at national borders. It was the case in Germany. Uh, now it looks like it will be more regular, but we know that it happened uh, from time to time in uh, the German borders. We know that a country like Austria has been quite um, active on controlling borders in the past few years. Uh, a country like France as well. Uh, we remember maybe from 2015, um, also ongoing from the uh, COP24 back in the time that France has reinstated control at the borders for security reasons. Uh, we know that from time to time, France was proceeding with uh, border control, for example, in the southeast with the border with Italy. And we know that it has been a, a big issue between the two countries when it comes to, um, you know, um, the border and the respect of Schengen um, area uh, agreements. Um, here, it's a question of um, solidarity as well that is put into question by a number of countries when they, uh, you know, renounce to uh, the agreement and the main basis of how Schengen is functioning, which is one of the uh, core mechanism of the EU. And if you close your own border, or at least if you put some checks uh, at your own border, you put into question um, the functioning of the EU, but you also uh, put the pressure on your neighbor. So it's about finding common solution rather than just national ones. But indeed, in the current context, political context, many countries will be tempted to do it again. And if a country like Germany, which is one of the most important in the EU and has proven that, you know, try to guarantee the functioning of the EU is questioning it, then we might have even further domino effect. Well, OK, so 
You, you mentioned the impact of, of border closures on, on surrounding countries. And, of course, uh, nowhere is it clearer than with Poland, where Prime Minister Tusk has already um, uh, uh, criticized the, 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 the closure or the uh, tightening of controls on the German border and saying that simply affects logistics and trade. Um, you know, long queues of Polish trucks trying to get into or out of, of Germany are being delayed, and that has an economic impact. Uh, what kind of middle ground, what kind of solutions do you think the EU has available to it? Well, it's a, it's a very, very difficult question because, you know, over the past few years, at least since 2015, uh, EU institutions and policymakers have been trying to find solutions. And they came up after years of negotiation and political infighting with a solution. It's not a perfect solution, but this is something that, you know, um, is trying to fix the problems. It's trying to tackle the challenges, which is the EU's pact on migration and asylum, which has been signed uh, into law um, last year. At the, at the end of last year, just right before the um, elections in the parliament. And uh, this is about four different pillars. It's about securing external borders. It's about, uh, you know, trying to have faster and more efficient procedures when it comes to the process of uh, migration, um, of the of the profiles of the, of the people applying to asylum also. It's about uh, a more effective system of solidarity. We just talked about it, how we share the collective burden on, 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 on migration migration and asylum between countries and then it's about trying to find new partnerships uh, with countries in the in the neighborhood of the EU. Um, we see that it can fix a few things but also we need to understand that the current debates happen in a new political context which is migration is still a very pregnant issue when it comes to domestic and European politics. It's still one of the major uh, topics that we hear during election campaigns and second uh, there are there has been uh, resolution at national elections as well as European elections where voters tended to um, um, approach the election with a more um, right-leaning position. Right. So see that the European Parliament, for example, is more right-wing. Understood. So, so uh, as you say, uh, the electorate is, is, um, is, is, is basically saying, well, look, you know, let, we have to do something about this influx of migrants. But what about the migrants that are already uh, in the EU? Uh, you know, uh, where there is a backlash uh, because the, the native population is feeling, well, we're not getting, you know, the, the uh, funds allocated to us that the migrants are, et cetera, et cetera. What are countries going to do about repatriation? I mean, this was a huge challenge in the EU, in the EU and as I said earlier, brought down the Conservative government. Is the EU going to fare any better? Well, first, this is important to distinguish between migrants and refugees, right? And you have the illegal migrants that are present on our territory, and you have the asylum, the refugees people uh, who have been controlled and who have the status. And for the first one, it's very difficult because um, you, sometimes, very often, you, you, you cannot find necessarily the people. And so this is what um, many people, uh, policymakers, um, members of the European Parliament today are asking is to basically give more power to security um, services forces rather than the judges. So they are criticizing the fact that there is too much emphasis on justice rather than on uh, security. Uh, and this is a debate that has been ongoing in the EU for years and years and years, and it's not the end of this. And there is a big political polarization there on how basically to, uh, what line to draw between um, security and justice, um, how to respond to this challenge, which is a very difficult challenge because of uh, its complicity, technically speaking, and in terms of procedures. Now, what um, the people um, are also forgetting about is that migration and a particular migra illegal migration is a big concern for population but at the same time another concern is purchasing of power and the functioning of the economy and here we have to see that many countries uh, need migration economic migration to be sure that their economy is functioning so there is a very important political debate and a political tension here between these two needs more security so less illegal migration but in the same time 
uh, better functioning of our economy. Which well, ab is, uh, absolutely. I think no one is disputing the fact that legal migration um, from people who've been vetted, who bring skills into the economy, is, is, is more than welcome. Now, uh, in that vein, Romania and Bulgaria are applying for accession to the Schengen uh, uh, region. Uh, is this going to complicate matters even, even further? I don't think it's completing matters. We know that Romania and Bulgaria have been following and uh, ensuring all the requirements, technical requirements from the European Commission. And this is something uh, we should say is, is not normal, that Romania and Bulgaria are still not in Schengen. It's a political reasoning behind, uh, mainly um, linked to national politics in uh, the Netherlands as well as in uh, Austria. Now, uh, will it complicate it? Uh, no, I don't think so, because uh, when, we, when it comes to um, Schengen area, what is crucial today is to control our external borders. And Romania and Bulgaria are external borders of the EU, and they are not outside of it. So bringing them to Schengen as soon as possible, fully into Schengen as soon as possible, is something that is very important politically for the EU. Um, we know that elections are coming up in Bulgaria and Romania, so this is time for the EU finally to act on this and let Romania and Bulgaria join in the Schengen area. Understood. Now, um, one other thing, very briefly, if you would, please, um, and it's going slightly, slightly off topic. Um, and this is really about uh, Ukraine, and and um, well, clearly it's, it is connected in that there have been a lot of Ukrainian refugees coming into Poland, so a very, a very relevant topic here. Uh, and the Rammstein conference, uh, which is due to be held very shortly to discuss support for Ukraine, um, although President Biden has been invited or was invited to it, he has declined the invitation, citing hurricane needs. Uh, in his country, which is, of course, suffering from the devastating effects of hurricanes. Um, what is the impact likely to be? Do you think that the conference will still go on? Should it go on? And what is the message that this is sending uh, to, to Russia? I think the meeting should go on, of course, absolutely. And it's a need. We need to gather all together. And if President Biden is not there. This is a problem, as is the president of the U.S., but we still need to gather and discuss how we can support better Ukraine. Uh, this is something that is urgent. We need more support for Ukraine. We need more cohesion and unity within the EU, but also within the Transatlantic Alliance. And such meetings are extremely important. We know that the U.S. are going into elections, so we need to be sure that we are coordinated, whatever the results of the election will be in the US, we need to continue to support Ukraine. Understood. Now, you mentioned the elections, and of course, uh, uh, Pres ex-President Trump is in the running for that. Um, now, many have said that his, his relationship with Putin is actually undermining uh, the US's best interest. And we, we heard this uh, recently, very recently, that uh, Trump has had a number of conversations, some say seven, uh, with President Putin. What do you read into that? Well, we need to distinguish first what Trump is saying during the campaign and what he will actually do after he might be uh, re-elected. This is the first condition of, uh, you know, thinking about a potential return of Trump at the White House. Uh, second, um, we can see that Trump and a large part of the Republicans uh, are willing to talk to Russia and are willing to talk to Putin because they think that uh, the most urgent for Ukraine is to sign uh, a peace, to stop the war. Um, I believe this is, a, this is a miscalculation for the moment because Russia is not willing to sign any peace. They want Ukraine to fail, they want Ukraine to fall, and this is what is dangerous today. Signing a peace, stopping the war is important, of course, stop the suffering, uh, stop the killing, stop the aggression from Russia to Ukraine. But what is even more important is to make sure that Ukraine will survive, that Ukraine will win at the end. And right. this is not the conditions set by Russia at the moment. And Understood. We not Russia well, I'm sure the content of those telephone conversations will come out sooner or later. Mr. Lekinu, Le thank you very, very much indeed for your very detailed analysis. Do come and see us again soon. Have a good day. Thank you very much. You too. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.
And that's all from us in this episode of World Talks. Don't go away, there's lots more coming up. Bye for now.